Hello, everyone. Good evening. Well, to keep with our post-graduation seminar, today I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, Pau Androli, who I know a little bit. <laughs> so Pau is a, is a biomedical engineer with a master in German, and then he moved to UK to do his PhD as a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Bath where I have the pleasure to meet him and work with him a little. And now he's uh, in US working in the um, Waze Institute as uh, one of the leaders in a um, bio-inspired bio therapeutic team and, bio and diagnosis platforms. So Paulan has a lot of uh, experience work with diagnostic uh, biofats, and different kind of platforms. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your time, for the opportunity to have you here with us and to share a little bit of your knowledge, knowledge with us. Thank you very much, Pawan. Thank you, Marina, and thank you for the invite and kind words. Uh, hello, everyone. So, so today, actually, I'm going to talk about one of the projects uh, that uh, my team is developing, which we call the eRapid technology. So just briefly, uh, as uh, Marina mentioned, I'm Pawan Jolly, working as a senior staff scientist. So some of the research focus of my teams are, uh, although it's mostly based on translation of science, but we also look into biomarker discovery, of course, development of electrochemical sensing platform, organ on chip technology and also synthetic biology based sensing uh, mechanism and more recently i have also joined the wis diagnostic accelerator as a technology lead uh, which is a institute-wide effort of identifying clinical unmet need and also marrying it with uh, you know technology development to address and have an impact in the society so talking about today's presentation, which is eRapid technology. So what was the biggest motivation for us to start such a platform was basically the global diagnostic need. So there is an increase in the diagnostic lab testing worldwide and it's due to multiple reasons. For instance, aging population, growing management of chronic diseases, increased turnaround time, and more recently because of the current pandemic that we need more and more diagnostic platforms. And these, uh, these needs are actually incentivized on new clinical care models, which needs to be cost effective. And the way the trend is going on is going more and more towards the patient, you know, like point of care, home health care, leading to both patient empowerment as well as clinical clinicians empowerment. So what is a good example of such a device? I'm sure everyone knows about a glucometer, which is a blood glucose monitoring device used by millions of people across the world, is an excellent example of, you know, home diagnostics and, you know, which where the patients can monitor their own disease and, you know, better manage their health, basically. So why isn't why we haven't seen such devices for multiple other indications? The reason being a glucose monitoring device is based on enzymes and using enzymes, you can only target a limited uh, number of ligands, which could be which doesn't really address the vast range of diseases. So in order to address the whole range of different indications and diseases, we have to look into affinity based sensing. And in affinity-based sensing, uh, the way it actually works is you use you have a probe which actually detects a molecular of interest, and you have a particular change which is picked up by the system. So since our talk today is on electrochemical sensing, we uh, so my focus will be also just on you know where we are in terms of electrochemical sensing in terms of multiplex diagnostics. So unlike Electrochemical, unlike optical sensing, electrochemical sensing is quite prone to fouling. And what I mean by that is what you're seeing in, in electrochemical sensors is a surface modification. So it's very difficult to decouple an excitation and emission at the electrode surface. So anything which binds, you know, from a sample which is not specific can also give you a signal. That is what we refer to fouling. One of the way of addressing biofouling is by tuning surface chemistry. And a lot of research is out there where people have looked into different areas in order to how to address this particular problem. 
while we are addressing the problem, there is definitely an ideal surface chemistry, you know, certain parameters that needs to be taken into consideration for its application in electrochemical sensing. For instance, it should have limiting insulating effect because if, if the surface chemistry is insulating, it can result in total passivation of the surface and you lose the sensitivity. It should have anti-falling properties. What I mean by that is that it should only enable specific binding and uh, prevent the non-specific binding of off targets. It should have excellent charge transfer kinetics. What I mean by that is basically the electrons or ions should be easily able to diffuse through the layer to the electrode surface so that you can actually monitor the uh, change. And of course, it should be a platform where you can attach different probes like antibodies or you know, aptamers and so forth. So if you actually look into the literature, you can actually broadly, call it, uh, broadly uh, classify the surface chemistry in two main groups. One is the self-assembled monoliths like tiles, you know, um, selenes and so forth. And the other one is polymer chemistry. So there are also different kinds of polymer chemistry, including both conducting and non-conducting polymers. But both of these aspects have certain advantages and disadvantages, like you can lose conductivity, you know, it's difficult to produce mass produce, you have limited immobilization options. So the eRapid technology is addressing some of these key challenges by introducing four key innovations. So first one is our proprietary nanocomposite coating, which can be simply drop casted on electrochemical sensors, which maintains the electronic sensitivity. The other one is the method uh, by which we are coating. Uh, so we have developed a rapid method that enables mass manufacturing of uh, electrochemical sensors. We have our own strategy of multiplexing, which when coupled with the surface chemistry enables very specific and sensitive detection of multiple targets on the same chip in the single channel without having any complicated microfluidics. And the last part, which I'm not going to touch in this presentation, but we have also worked on development of novel assays for small molecules and pathogen, uh, which really makes it really interesting, the platform that it can enable such a vast uh, range of targets in complex samples. So let's start with surface chemistry. Um, so if you actually look into traditional self-assembled monolayers and you code the self-assembled monolayers on bare gold, what you see on the graph is you actually lose more than 40 to 50 percent of the conductivity of the metal just because of the insulating nature of the self-assembled monolayer. And these are the most commonly used uh, peg SAM or betaine based SAM because of their anti-falling properties. So when you challenge these sensors in, let's say, one person BSA for one hour or more, you lose nearly almost all the sensitivity within 24 hours. What we have developed is a 3D porous matrix, a nanocomposite coating, which is a cross-linked denatured bovine serum albumin, which is intercalated with nanoparticles, either gold nanowire, reduced carbon, or carbon nanotubes based on the application via a cross-linker. And with this specific recipe, one of the key features you have to look here is when we coat these sensors uh, with our coating, you retain more than 95% of the conductivity of the metal. And when you challenge these sensors in one person BSA or human serum or even human plasma for over a month, you retain nearly 90% of the conductivity. So that because we can you know, challenge these sensors for over a month, over one month, this opens a whole plethora of applications and variables. And you can see on the SEM, the porous nature of this coating that really enables a really good charge transfer kinetics. And since it is a protein-based material, there are several advantages, like you can actually, uh, not only you have stable electrochemistry, you can also have robust immobilization, uh, immobilization protocol from you know, amine linking to other click chemistry. It's a drop casting method. That means it's highly scalable and robust. And we are using very cheap materials. Uh, unlike tiles, these are very low cost and simple. So taking a step further, we wanted to characterize each layer by layer modifications. And for that, we use electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, which is essentially looking into the charge transfer resistance. So basically we have a redox probe in the solution and we are looking into the resistance that the redox probe experiences while, you know, uh, while basically diffusing from the solution to the electrode surface. So in essentially, when you coat any metal, you should see an increase in the charge transfer. 
So over here, what you see is you can actually do step-by-step -step modification of the surface and perform the whole sandwich ELISA on the surface. And uh, on the EIS result, you can see a very specific binding of a specific sensor while no uh, non-specific binding from our non-specific or the control sensor. And on the left, what you can see is how we code the sensors. This can be easily you know, inkjet printed to actually enable mass production of these devices. Taking a step further, we also looked into electrochemical characterizations. So one, uh, you can all see actually a really good uh, reversible redox uh, oxidation and reduction between the bare gold and our coating. And also it has minimal you know, effect on the electrochemical behavior when you know, the gold was coated uh, without coating. So you can actually see a very similar diffusion rate, which really shows uh, you know, that it is a you know, diffusion limited process. So initially our coating used to take uh, you know, 24 hours. So we used to drop cast on the sensors and leave it for 24 hours, which is not really that exciting when you have to think about commercialization. So we introduced a new method of localized heating. So we optimize our coating even further. And you know, by using just this localized heating, we were able to reduce the time from 24 hours to less than a minute. So we were able to now scale it really uh, on a very large scale, and this can also be incorporated into a real-to-real -real process system. But what happens to the electrochemical behavior, though? So if you actually see the, uh, you know, the performance of our rapid coating versus 24-hour coating, we didn't see any difference when we performed the assay. And when we also looked into the AFM, feed, AFM image, we were also able to, again, uh, demonstrate the same porous nature of the coating. And using this rapid coating, we challenged our sensors even up to nine weeks. So last time we actually showed you for one month, this is for nine weeks. And in plasma, we were still able to retain most of the conductivity and it did not lose that much of sensitivity. So it was really enhanced the properties even further. Further. Now, what do we do with these coatings? So next step was to actually see how, how effective this coating is when it's compared to traditional you know, systems like traditional ELISAs. So to start with, we actually just bought you know, a simple antibody pair from a company and uh, basically translated on our sensor without doing any optimization. So in this case, what you see on the left is you know, just the picture taken from the company website. And you can see the LOD, uh, what they claim to be 16 picogram per mil. And this one is in buffer. So what we did was um, we basically translated the antibody pair on our ELISA and did the, you know, the electrochemical ELISA. And we were able to retain the similar limit of detection with just 10 microliter of uh, whole you know, human plasma in significantly reduced time. So this was really exciting for us that we were able to match uh, the limit of detection without doing any sample preparation of course, in this case, it was plasma. And for this case, we use interleukin-6, which is a cytokine, a marker of inflammation. Following that, we did a range of biomarkers. Um, and uh, here is a comparison between electro our electrochemical sensor versus our ELISA. And you can see magnitude of sensitivity difference uh, between both when used in, uh, you know, in human plasma. So with our sensors, we were able to perform nearly in 30 minutes, while the plasma took a couple of hours uh, and more volume in terms of the sample. So this really shows you know, the sensitivity, how we can actually push the sensitivity using our electrochemical sensors. Following that, we were also interested in, you know, in, in, uh, in developing microfluidics. So you know, my team members also uh, developed this uh, robust system, which they uh, refer to as ADS Octopus. And the reason they call it Octopus is because you can run eight different chips at the same time. Uh, it has multiple, uh, you know, multiple uh, features like it, it's Bluetooth connected to a laptop. So you can literally use an app and control the whole system, uh, wireless powered yeah, and also easy communication and script code. So using this sensor, we were able to, for instance, this is an example for NT-Pro BNP, which is um, which is a marker of a uh, heart attack. And we were able to get a really correlation in significantly reduced time. 
We also developed other kind of cartridges, like in this case, it's a hexagon uh, microfluidic cartridges, which is simply 3D printed. Um, and uh, this we use to perform, uh, to detect uh, cardiac troponin uh, within 15 minutes in just 40 microliters of spiked human plasma. So uh, the other thing which I was quite interested to uh, basically explore was, you know, the stability of the coating and the electrochemical signals, because as you know, most of uh, many of you must be knowing that, you know, the other chemistries like thiol chemistries and so forth aren't stable for a longer period of time. And that's why it's quite interesting because that really also adds to the shelf life of a cartridge when you're commercializing a product like these. So in the first case, we wanted to see if we can actually regenerate the chip. So in this case, uh, what we did was we basically performed the assay. In this case, it was IL-6. Uh, we did the measurement. You can actually see uh, you know, the, the solid black uh, curve showing the specific signal, while you know, the solid uh, gray curve is basically the background. Um, and then what we did was we did a regeneration of the chip by using different pH solution and stored the chip for one month in the fridge uh, and then redid the experiment again. Of course, there's a strong, there's a slight drip, but it was really encouraging for us, us to know that we can actually regenerate the chip, store it for a month and redo the experiment. And we can still get similar, you know, similar, if similar, but if not, uh, same but similar peak uh, after one month. And this drift could be, you know, just not related to the coating, but it could also be just the degradation of the antibodies over time. The other exciting thing I would like to point out over here is our oxidation potential. So our oxidation potential or is very close, is close to zero. Now that is really exciting for electrochemistry is because um, any potential which is above a certain range can actually cause interfering signal. And this interfering signal can come from, you know, uric acid, dopamine, tryptophan, because you can actually directly oxidize these on, onto the gold electrodes. So since our oxidation poten uh, potential is close to zero, we actually avoid all those kind of interfering molecules uh, leading to no to very minimal background in our electrochemical signals. Taking a step further, we actually also stored the coating for up to 20 weeks and performed assays just to assess the coating and you know the you know the the reliability of the coating. And uh, as you can see over in the graph, uh, just at room temperature, the coating was stable over over or until you know 20 weeks, and I'm sure it would be stable even more, which is even good because uh, this coating can be further enhanced by just storing at you know and cold temperature. Um, which you cannot really do with, uh, you know, some of the tiles. The other exciting thing over here is the stable signal. What I mean by that is like taking a step further. So at this step, let's say, you know, on day one, we perform the electrochemical assay uh, and we do the measurement. So that would be our day one. But we also left the S, uh, chip after the assay and stored it at room temperature and tried to detect the signal on day two, day four, day eight. So over here, it was really interesting to see that the signal that was produced was conserved on our coating for over eight days. So that really opens uh, a lot of exciting opportunities where, you know, the patient uh, in a remote setting can perform the assay and then just, you know, post the cartridge to a central uh, location where it can be measured, uh, you know, after seven days. And I'm sure like, you know, for, for posting purposes, we don't need more than a week time, especially in the US at least. Um, so as our topic was multiplex diagnostics, so this was, uh, you know, the other aspect as how we can actually perform multiplex diagnostic, which is specific and as well as sensitive. So, uh, of, we are using an electrochemical ELISA, um, and just to give a little bit background, so usually people use soluble TMB. TMB is basically a substrate for enzyme. In this case, it's HRP. So if you use soluble TMB, what happens is that the the signal is then produced in the solution. You know, the the enzyme catalyzes the TMB. Electrons are produced in the solution. So if you have neighboring electrodes, the neighboring electrodes can pick up the signal. And if you flush these sensors, uh, you actually lose all the signal because you know the the electrons are produced in the signal. 
What we are using is a precipitating TMB. So what essentially happens over here is that you have local precipitation of the reaction or of the signal at the molecular binding event. So in this case, it will be in the middle electrode. And because it's local precipitation, you don't see or you, you don't pick up the signal from the neighboring electrodes. And this will only happen if you have a reliable surface chemistry, which is specific and uh, specific, uh, basically. And when you flush these electrodes, uh, you can still retain the uh, signal because this because it is it has now precipitated on the surface, and that is what essentially helps us to actually detect over the period of one week or more. So using this aspect, we were able to, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, the first thing. So the first application we looked into was sepsis, where we looked into a fourplex. Uh, not really a fourplex, it was a threeplex uh, with BSA as a control. So in this case, we modified each electrode with a uh, biomarker of interest. So it was PCT, which is procalcitonin, CRP, C-reactive protein, and PAM. So PAM was detected by our uh, proprietary FCM bill mechanism, which is looking into the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and BSA was used as a control. So in this case, we use 50% diluted blood just because one of our, you know, one of our SA, uh, it was a requirement for one of our SA for it to work. So with, with just one chip, we were able to detect one, two, or all the markers together. Taking it a step further, we actually created a fourplex. And in this case, we basically, uh, in, uh, basically combined two biomarkers from heart attack and two biomarkers from traumatic brain injury and just using 15 microliters of whole blood. So this time it was no processing whatsoever. We directly used a spiked whole blood. And within nearly 30 minutes, we were able to have a whole multiplexed analysis where you can detect two or all the four at the same time in different range. So this was really exciting for us because this was the first demonstration of using directly whole blood um, and having sensitive detection down to picogram per mil. Uh, we also did clinical validation. So here you're going to see just some examples. Um, of course, in the paper, there are more. In this case, we used to looked into GFAB, uh, troponin I, uh, and you can actually see a very good correlation between uh, the measured GFAB and the, um, and the assigned one for it. And on the right, it's the bald Atman plot. So you can actually see the variation uh, of the signal between uh, the allies are the standard versus our biosensor. So it was really good at the lower concentration, but of course you can see some variation at higher concentration, which was mostly because our sensors were saturating uh, earlier than the ELISAs basically. So since COVID happened, of course, uh, like any other lab, we wanted to actually address and see if we can actually use our platform to address some of the diagnostic unmet need for, for COVID as well. So in this case, uh, first we started with developing a multiplexed uh, COVID serology test. Uh, the reason behind this was basically we wanted to see the effect of multiplexing and how it can actually increase the sensitivity and the specificity of the assay. And especially, you know, now with the uh, the rollout of the vaccines, you know, a lot of patients, if not exposed to COVID, will mostly have. Uh, especially with the MRN technology, they will have the spike one antibodies while not have the nuclear capsid, for instance. So it can be used for multiple applications, uh, which is yet to be uh, yet to be figured out. I would say, like scientifically, I think we are not there yet. But if if uh, there's an application, for instance, in the monitoring of the patient or just to know if they were exposed to COVID or they have developed the antibodies, this platform can definitely be used. So in this case, we actually modified each electrode with you know, either spike, RBD, which is receptor binding domain or nuclear capsid, and you can actually uh, you know, detect antibodies specific to them based on the patient samples we received. So we tested these with 112 uh, clinical patient samples, and you can actually see uh, detection of IgG and IgM. So individually, you can actually the IgG worked pretty well, probably because uh, you know they had high concentration of IgG. Uh, mostly, most of them had really good sensitivity and specificity. But if you actually combine, they all reach to one. Uh, in IgM, it is more obvious, while the specific specificity and the sensitivity of each antigen uh, um, sensor was quite low. 
but when you actually combine them all together, the sensitivity was increased uh, uh, multifolds, uh, nearing 90% in both the cases. We also did uh, CRISPR electronics. So in this case, we wanted to actually develop an assay which can be, uh, which could be used in a similar way as the affinity-based sensing. So for those who do not have, who doesn't know how the CRISPR works, is basically is based on CRISPR enzymes. So in our case, we use Cas12a. So what it has is usually a guide, uh, you know, um, a guide RNA, and what it actually detects is the target. So you take the sample, you amplify the sample, and if the CRISPR detects the target, it gets activated and it collaterally start uh, cutting all the uh, single-stranded DNA. So we use that mechanism to generate an electrochemical response. So in our case, you know, we had this reporter DNA, which uh, either will be cut by the CRISPR or you know will be or will be not. So in our case, if you have if you don't have the target, you know, all the uh, reported uh, DNA will bind to our surface, which was modified with PNA. Uh, PNA is peptide nucleic acid. The reason we used this was to actually enhance the binding and also, um, you know, so that this sensor can be used in different conditions and strength. So uh, when you have the target DNA um, bound to the surface, you actually see the signal of our substrate through an enzymatic reaction. But if you have the target, the CRISPR basically cuts the reported DNA, and therefore you don't have the enzyme that can bind to the surface, and you don't have any reaction. So in principle, if you have the target, you're not going to see the signal. If you, if you don't have the target, you're going to see the signal. So using this, you can actually see this is what I mean. So if you have a negative sample, you will see a very high signal. And if you have a positive uh, sample, you don't see any signal. So we use this with uh, 30 clinical saliva samples, and we were able to differentiate both the positive and the negative patient group with 100% uh, with, with sensitivity and specificity. We also characterize our sensors compared to fluorescence assays. So this is logit analysis, which is basically used to um, used to provide detail on the probability how probability that the sensor will able to differentiate uh, a certain number of copies. So you actually make different dilutions and uh, basically run different samples. And you know, in this case, we ran five samples. You can see the fluorescent assay at one copy was able to differentiate three out of five, while the electrochemical was able to differentiate all five out of five. So when you plot this, uh, we were able to get a sensitivity of you know, 0 0.8 copies per microliter with our electrochemical sensors, which is literally you know, looking into atomolar detection. Taking a step forward, we also multiplex both serology as well as the viral RNA detection. So we've modified our last electrode with our PNA, and we did different combination where we either don't have any antibodies or the virus, or we have one or the other. And with our sensors, we were able to simultaneously detect both the antibodies as well as the virus with high specificity and sensitivity. So this we actually reported as the first platform that could actually do both CRISPR and antibody on the same chip in the single channel um, uh, detection, looking into multi-omics data basically. So finally, uh, you know, since we were talking about different targets, I also wanted to showcase, you know, what we have done so far and what the platform can actually do. Uh, since it's a, you know, it's a platform technology, we looked into a range of different analytes, as small as histamine and cortisol, to as big as antibodies, and these are different biomarkers that has been tested so far in different sample types you know, from whole blood to culture media. And this actually essentially shows, you know, the, the uh, what this technology can do and, uh, you know, the range it can do. Uh, so what we essentially say is, you know, if you have a probe or antibody available, we can definitely translate on our system and get the sensitive detection uh, that is required clinically or, you know, or any other application. So in summary, I hope I was able to showcase you our electrochemical sensor, which is a low cost platform, which can enable rapid results in low sample volume in a portable or handheld version. And of course, in a multiplex detection in a single channel and you know that uh, leading to a platform technology. 
And before I end, of course, you know, uh, I cannot uh, thank enough all my team members, uh, my PI, you know, Don Ingber, and also some of my, uh, uh, you know, my uh, team members like Sanjay, Nolan, Helena, you know, uh, all of them, they have worked really hard uh, together uh, to bring the technology where there is. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, Zhao actually from Brazil who actually did all the uh, microfluidics work on the on the system development, Mohammed on the fluidic cartridge, Josh on the, uh, on the CRISPR electronics, and, uh, you know, and many others. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. It was a very, very nice and excited presentation. I know that I love this part of uh, research, but <laughs> I do like your presentation. It was really, really inspired me. And I'm just going to check if you have any questions here in the chat. If anyone has uh, any questions, even if it's uh, in Portuguese, you can send to me. Well, uh, I'd like to ask you something because <laughs> I see your research as um, and all your team working in a really new and challenging area. And what do you think is going to be like the next generation of sensors and biosensor has going to be the next like 10 years <laughs> <laughs> i would i mean <clears throat> actually this is an interesting uh question and you know i'll i'll say that i would actually like to see something where you know you don't have any probes anything no biological i think one of the thing I have started thinking quite a lot is that, you know, when we are doing electrochemistry or any kind of sensing, we have the whole spectrum of data, right? For instance, in EIS, you have the old Nyquist plot, but there's so much of information that I feel like is there in the noise uh, that no one is trying to deconvolute it. So if we can actually get like these signatures and stuff and try to develop a new kind of system, which could be maybe even more non-invasive, I think that would be something to look into. I mean, one of the example, something similar, but not exactly, is like the micro tweezers, for instance, you know, you can actually get the signatures and you can try to deconvolute the data and, you know, get, you know, get something substantial. I think that would be really exciting. I think everyone is focusing, which I feel is too much on what they have learned you know from the books you know the cv should look like this and there's an oxidation and the reduction but i think we need to look a little bit more deeper as to what happens on the other level and you know if we can actually use it so that would be definitely exciting but in terms of in terms of sensing i think we are seeing a huge huge uh change into how the testing is going more and more towards the point of care and you, we are seeing new and new innovation, but I really hope it can be become more and more uh, simple. Uh, one of the uh, one of the features that we are also working on is simplification, so that we don't have that many essay steps. So you know, reducing the essay steps and making it really straightforward. I think that is going to be the key if you want to bring something home. Yeah. I do agree with you, and I think they're going to be more simple and more available for everyone in general. And there is a question here asking you about, you mentioned uh, the COVID tests, uh, and here in Brazil at least, and of course in all the countries, we had a lot of problems with different kind of um, genetic variation from or mutation from the virus. And the system that you were, we were working with, uh, do you think about or do you have the um, opportunity to test with different kind of, of mutations or virus? So, uh, so the CRISPR work, I, we did it with Jim Collins lab, who basically has done so much work on the CRISPR and, you know, they also founded the Sherlock company as well. Uh, so even with our CRISPR, we are actually looking into the whole gene actually, which is really good because, you know, you're actually would be looking in all kinds of mutations. 
Um, the best part about the CRISPR is, I mean, if, uh, you know, for people who do not have the background in CRISPR is that it can actually detect single molecule, sorry, a uh, single nucleotide difference. So if there's any mutation, the CRISPR is not going to work. So although, you know, there are really quick tests like LAM-based tests uh, that can actually get give you false positive or you can actually lose, you know, the mutations. But CRISPR uh, itself is, you know, it is something that can actually detect very specifically and sensitively. But uh, I know like the groups have looked into other other mutations and stuff and they have papers based on it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, at this moment, at this point, no one more, no more questions. So I like that. again, <laughs> again, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, for your presentation, for everyone, everything that you share with us. It was really nice to talk about a little bit with you again, to see you again. Yes. It's so good to, to keep in touch. And I'd, I'd like to thank you, everyone, from post-graduation that is uh, following us at this moment. And that's, that's this for today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite. I think it was great uh, seeing you and, you know, uh, and just giving an overview of the work that we are doing at the WIS. And uh, good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.